In my talk today, I'm going to talk about non-commutative showcase simplices. This is joint work with Eli Shemovich, who's now at Ben Gurion University in Israel. So first, I want to talk about motivation, which means I want to talk about classical showcase simplices. And I'll tell you what they are and, and what they're good for. So let conv denote the category of compact convex sets where the morphisms are continuous affine maps. And I also want to consider the category of, of what I'll call function systems. So these are closed self-adjoint unital subspaces of a commutative c star algebra, where the morphisms here are, are unital order homomorphisms. So in other words, they preserve the natural order of positive elements in the function system. And there's a theorem due to Cattison. It's often called Cattison's representation theorem. It goes back to 1951. And it says that a function system is unitally order isomorphic. Sorry, Matt, function Matt, system. Uh, so sorry to interrupt, but uh, the, there is an issue with your slides. Uh, the left edge is cut off. And oh, yeah. I seem not to be the only person who cannot see the whole slide. No, it, it, it's definitely the slide, yeah. Uh-oh. -uh. It's legible, but uh, it, it left a uh, quarter of an inch is... Um, let, me, uh, let me see if it's it was zoom. Because there's some left That's side like, of the no. screen which is cut off. Is this better? Well, the, 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 of course, that's fine, yeah. No, it's, it's now we don't have the right side. Oh. <laughs> but, uh, are my slides legible now, at least? No, it's worse. Now we only see the top left-hand corner of your slides. The title screen displayed fine, so I don't know what the res what's happening with the resolution of the rest of them. Uh, when when you were showing them to scroll instead of in the uh, in the slide view, everything was visible. It's perhaps not quite as big, but how about this? Does this help at all? This is almost all right. Only uh, half of a letter, only one third of a letter is missing. At the can, you, uh, can you make things out though? Like, is this going to suffice? I would go back to the first way. It was a bit, just a few letters, it was okay. a letter or two at the yeah, left. Yeah, this, this, is, this is mostly okay. Yeah. Mostly okay? Okay. Right. Sorry, hang on a sec. Okay. Well, let's see how this goes. Matt, Matt if, if I may, I, th I think the main problem is that you have opened other windows uh, floating around on the left and the right and at the bottom, and that yeah. the Zoom doesn't let anyone else see from your screen when you share your screen, but it, it feels that it covers what is below this, this new window. So if you could close other windows, perhaps it will help. Right now, what you have done right now is, is I think it's, it looks good. Okay, let me uh, try something here. How's this? Much better. Excellent. Okay. So Very perfect. Back. Oh, uh, and you've lost the left. Okay. All right. So uh, a result going back to Cattison from 1951 uh, says that every function system is actually isomorphic as a function system to a, a special function system, specifically the function system consisting of continuous affine functions on the state space of the original function system. So the state space is a compact convex set. And this actually gives us a, a dual equivalence between the categories of convex sets and the, and the category of function systems. And so this should be a, a C goes to A, A of C here. And so Choquet theory to me is really the study of, of the convex set C or equivalently the, the function system A of C using the duality between the two, two objects and also the interplay between the space of continuous affine functions, which is contained inside the, the space of continuous functions on C. So 
So say that a, a probability measure on the space of continued, continuous functions on our compact convex set represents a point in the convex set if when it is strict down to the continuous affine functions, it's equivalent to the point evaluation at the point x. So what you should think of this as saying that x is really the integral against the, the measure mu of the points in, in C. So in particular, if uh, it's, it's sort of a generalization of saying that X is a convex combination of points in C. This is really the right, if you like, uh, infinite dimensional generalization of a convex combination. And uh, a theorem of Choquet and, and Bishop Deleu, Choquet was, was in the metrizable case, Bishop and Deleu is in the non-metrizable case, says that for every point X and C, I can find a representing probability measure for the point that is maximal on something called the Choquet order. And the Choquet order is defined by saying that, if, so if I have two probability measures, mu and nu, mu is dominated by nu if the integral of any convex function, continuous convex function against mu is, is less than or equal to the integral of the same function against nu. So you're testing your, your probability measures against your convex functions. And this encodes some kind of an order on the set of probability measures. And this order is actually telling you when your probability measure is supported on the extreme boundary. So by that, I mean this set of extreme points of C. Okay, so, so what this is saying is that I can take my point and I can get back a probability measure that represents that point and the support is all the way out along the boundary. So let's look at some special cases of this. Oh, I guess before I should, I should say, so in the, in the metrizable case, the support being in the boundary is actually equivalent to this maximality condition in the Choquet order. In the non-metrizable case, it's not necessarily equivalent, but it at least implies that the support is contained in the boundary. There's some measure theoretic issues that come up in the non-metrizable case. And it turns out that in order to avoid those, those measure theoretic conditions, you actually want to avoid talking about the measure theory and instead you want to talk about the order theory, which means you really want to look at the, at the Choquet order rather than trying to specify what the support of your measure is. So let's, let's look at a, well, okay. Yeah. So we say that a, a compact convex set is a simplex if for every point that, so I just finished saying that for every point you can find a representing measure supported on the boundary, if there's a unique such measure for every point, then we say that the compact convex set is a simplex or showcase simplex. Okay. And the intuition is that every point has a unique representation in terms of extreme points of my compact convex set. Okay. So in the, in the finite dimensional setting, Carity Doris theorem tells us that I can find finitely supported Shoke maximal representing measures for X. So what that means is I can, I can write X as a convex combination, an ordinary convex combination of extreme points. That's exactly what Carity Doris theorem says. The statement that the, the way of writing it in terms of extreme points is unique, that's saying that my compact convex set is a simplex or a showcase simplex. And we know what the, all of the simplices are in finite dimensions. They're the, the so-called n simplices. So in R, the one simplex is a line. In R squared, the two simplex is a triangle, and so on and so forth. So really, a, a simplex in some sense is a, is a generalization of the notion of a triangle. And so if I, if I restate the definition of a, of a Choquet simplex, what this is really saying is that a triangle is, is a, a shape with the property that every point has unique representation in terms of the vertices of the triangle. Okay, so this is really a, it's an attempt to write down a non-commutative generalization of a triangle because it turns out that as, as convex shapes, triangles have all kinds of nice properties. Okay. And so I wanna talk about some applications of this. So the first application, which is, course relevant to us is that 
Showcase simplices characterize the state spaces of unital commutative C star algebras. So we'll say that a simplex is a Bauer simplex if it has a closed extreme boundary. Okay, so that means the extreme points are closed. So in general, it's not true that the extreme points of a convex, of a compact convex set have to be closed. Okay. And what Bauer showed is that a function system is actually a C star algebra. So in other words, via that representation theorem of Cattison, the, uh, the C star algebra has the property that it's order isomorphic to the function system A of C, where C is a Bauer simplex, if and only if the original function system was a commutative C star algebra. And there's a, in each, uh, in finite dimensions, there's a unique D simplex, at least up to affine homomorphism. And if I translate what that's saying is that there's a unique commutative C star algebra of dimension D plus one. And of course we know that that's the C star algebra C of, of D plus one. And, uh, and that's actually the main result of, of my talk. Just kidding. So more generally, what this says is that C is a Bauer simplex, if and only if it's affinely homeomorphic to the space of probability measures on a compact Hausdorff space, say X. So in other words, K or C is what I should say there. C is the state space of, of C of X. As we, we know by the Reese Markov Kakutani representation theorem that state spaces of unital commutative C star algebras are exactly the probability measures. So Bauer's theorem is really, in the special case of unital commutative C star algebras, it's really implying Gelfand's representation theorem. Now, the second application I want to talk about is the ergodic decomposition theorem. So in topological dynamics, when you have a flow, and what I mean by a flow is I have a compact Hausdorff space X and I have a group G that acts on X via, via homeomorphisms. So in other words, there's a, there's a group homomorphism into the homeomorphism, homeomorphism group of X. And one of the things you often wanna do in topological dynamics is you wanna look at the affine flow of probability measures on X. So for example, if you care about something like amenability, well, one characterization of amenability is in terms of the existence of invariant measures for for actions on compact Hausdorff spaces. So in other words, in P of X, if I have an amenable group, I can find fixed points. Okay. So we, we care very much about this, this affine action. And so if I have an invariant probability measure in, so I'll, I'll write P of X to the G, these are the set of invariant probability measures. If it's an extreme point, then we say that it's ergodic. There are various characterizations of ergodic invariant measures, or ergodic measures, I should say. I should say. They're very important. Uh, the characterization I care about at the moment is the fact that they're exactly the extreme points of the invariant measures. And the set of invariant measures has a very nice property. It's actually a simplex. So by the choquet bishop Delu integral representation theorem that I mentioned a couple of slides ago, we immediately get the result that every invariant probability measure can be uniquely decomposed in terms of ergodic probability measures. And the uniqueness is really coming from the fact that I have a simplex and in a simplex you have a unique way of decomposing points in terms of extreme points. And uh, it, so th this result has been known for a long time. It was actually known long before Choquet proved his theorem and Bishop's Lou proved their theorem. But their results really give sort of a, in my opinion, the, the easiest, most accessible proof of this fact. And a third application I wanna talk about is, is a dynamical characterization of groups that have property T. So I won't, won't say so much about property T. I, one definition is that in the, if, if you look at the unitary representations of your group, then it has property T that's saying that the, the trivial representation is, is isolated in a, in a certain sense, which you can make precise. So it's far away from, from the other unitary representations. And what Glasner and Weiss showed is that you can actually detect property T by looking at the dynamics of your group. So specifically a group has property T if and only if for every flow, the set of invariant measures corresponding to that flow is, is a Bauer simplex, which means that the extreme points are, are closed as I said. 
Now, by Bauer's theorem, we know that Bauer simplices are exactly the state spaces of unital commutative C-star algebras. So what this says, if I translate, is it says that G has property T if and only if whenever I look at the action of G on a commutative C-star algebra, so commutative C-star dynamical system, and a set of invariant states is the state space of a commutative C-star algebra. Not necessarily all that closely related to the C-star algebra that I started with. And what I want to talk about today is I want to talk about how these three applications that I just mentioned can be generalized to the non-commutative setting, meaning to non-commutative C-star algebras and non-commutative dynamics. And in order to do that, I need to briefly review the theory of non-commutative convexity. So this is a, uh, an idea that Ken Davidson and I introduced in a paper last year, inspired by uh, papers Many previous results, people had looked at other notions of non-commutative convexity. Um, so the, the motivation here is let's, let's start with a, an operator system, which I'll assume is closed. And what I mean by an operator system is it's the non-commutative counterpart of a function system. So it's a unital self-adjoint subspace of the C-star algebra. And the, the non-commutative state space of my operator system for this, what I want to do is I want to look at the set of all unital completely positive maps from my operator system into the n by n matrices. I want, though, to consider not just finite dimensional n or finite n, I want to actually consider uh, infinite cardinals. This is essential. And so when n is equal to infinity, I, I really want to think of mn as, as a set of bounded operators on a Hilbert space of dimension n. It's convenient, though, to, to write mn. And so this, so notice, by the way, that if n is equal to 1, this is just the ordinary state space. And I guess one of the themes in my talk is that this is really, in the non-commutative setting, the right counterpart of, of the state space of the commutative function system or commutative C-star algebra. So this space has the property, this space K has the property. These KNs are, are related by the fact that uh, they're, first of all, they're each compact in, in the natural topology, which is the, net, the point weak star topology. And they're related by the fact that the set K is closed under what we call NC convex combinations. So an NC convex combination looks a lot like an ordinary convex combination. Uh, now, instead of scalars, we allow matrices, or more generally operators, and the condition that the scalars add up to one is replaced by the condition that the sort of the, it, it's the right non-commutative notion of, of adding up to one, which is that the sum of our scalars, say alpha i star alpha i, is equal to one. And you can see that this is really some kind of a, a compression, if you're familiar with the theory of completely positive maps, it's, it's the same idea. And the, the point of considering the set K, I like to think of this uh, as, as really, it's encoding the relationship between the unital completely positive maps and their correspond, corresponding arvison stein string representation. So what I mean by that is Arvison's extension theorem tells us that we can extend a UCP map on S to the C-star algebra that it generates. And Steinspring theorem, theorem tells us that we can obtain the extension as the compression of a representation of the C-star algebra. So there's two objects here. There's the original map, and there's this representation that we've, we've obtained. And by considering the space K, we don't lose track of those two objects. Okay? Or the relationship between those two objects. So a, a non-commutative or an NC convex set is the natural abstraction of, of this NC state space that I just defined. So the general definition is that a, a compact NC convex set, it's, it's a set that over a dual operator space, and uh, it's a graded set just like the NC state space. Each KN is contained in a set of N by N matrices over our dual operator space E. There's a natural topology that we get from the fact that this is a dual operator space. We require that each can is closed in this dual topology. This is the counterpart of the point weak star topology that I just mentioned. 
And we require the case closed under non-commutative convex combinations. Okay. So here's an example that doesn't right away come from, an, from the state space of an operator system. This is the, what we call the NCD ball, and this is the natural non-commutative uh, generalization of, of the unit ball. So this is the set of all D tuples in MN of D okay, with the property that the norm of the tuple considered as a, as a row operator is less than or equal to one. Okay, just like the, the complex unit ball is the set of all points in, in the complex plane C with absolute value or modulus less than or equal to one. So this is exactly what you get if you write down the same thing, but you allow for, uh, for non-commutativity. And it turns out that this is actually, is actually a nice c star algebraic description of this, as, of this geometric object. So if I consider the Kuntz algebra, and I consider, so the generators of my Kuntz algebra are V1 to Vd, and I consider the operator system spanned by one and the Vi's and, and their adjoints, then this space K that I just wrote down, this NCD ball, turns out to be exactly the NC state space of, of the Kuntz operator system. <clears throat> so let, let me just take a, another look at this. So I have an operator system C with NC state space K. These KNs, each one consists of UCP maps from our operator system into MN. And any, an element A in my operator system S, I can think of this as a function on the space K. So specifically, if I have an element A, I get this function A hat, which maps the point X to X of A, because remember X is a, is a UCP map, and so X of A is just evaluation of this map at my original point A. And it's easy to check that functions that are obtained in this way, they have the following properties. They, they're graded in the sense that they map KN into MN. They respect direct sums in the sense that direct sums go to direct sums. And it's equivariant with respect to isometries. This is just saying that the result of applying, uh, of evaluating one of these maps after I've compressed it is the same as compressing after I do the evaluation. This is a fact that we use all the time when we, uh, when we use Stein's theorem, for example. And I want to abstract this and I want to consider functions on, a, on a, an abstract compact NC convex set. So we'll say that a function is an NC function if it has exactly the three properties that I just mentioned, except for one sort of subtle modification. Instead of considering equivariance with respect to isometries, I only want to consider equivariance with respect to unitaries, which is a, a weaker condition. If, in addition, I also have equivariance with respect to isometries, those are exactly the maps that I want to think of as my, of my non-commutative counterpart of, of an affine map. So in other words, somehow it's saying that it, restricts, it respects the convex structure of my, of my set K, the NC convex structure. <clears throat> and in fact, specifying that it's equivariant with respect to isometries is exactly saying that it respects NC convex combinations. Okay. This is very, very similar to the notion of an NC holomorphic function on an NC domain, which was defined by Taylor in 1973 and again by Foyt in, in 2000. Uh, so this, these definitions I've just introduced, they are to convexity with the theory of NC holomorphic functions or free uh, analytic functions are to the theory of, of holomorphic functions. Okay. There's a way to consider not just the NC functions, but actually the continuous NC functions and the continuous affine NC functions. Okay. And so I want to, I want to, in analogy with the commutative case, I'm going to write C of K for the set of continuous NC functions and A of K for the set of continuous affine NC functions on my set K. And 
And just to, to give you a better idea of what's going on here, if I take, say, three uh, continuous affine functions, A1, A2, and A3, and I consider the end C polynomial in these functions, uh, as on the screen, so A1, A2 squared, A3 minus A1, A3, A2 squared. So clearly, I've chosen this to, to illustrate the fact that this is non-commutative in general. And if I take a point x and k, then the way that I get back evaluation is I sort of do the obvious thing. I just plug in the point x into each of the, the affine functions. <clears throat> and it turns out that there's actually a very nice description of these spaces. They're very closely related. So the space of continuous NC functions is the C star algebra generated by the space of continuous affine NC functions. Uh, if you're familiar with the notion of maximal C star algebra for an operator system, it turns out that we can actually identify C of K with this, with this maximal C star algebra. The bi-dual is exactly the space of bounded NC functions in K where by bounded there's a, there's a natural notion of uh, uniform norm, which I'm not going to need, so I won't get into it. But the, the point is that there's sort of very nice descriptions of these objects that are completely analogous to the descriptions of, of their classical or commutative counterparts. The proof of this theorem, it uses the, the NC uh, Gelfand representation theorem of Takasaki from 1967. So this is an annals paper of Takasaki. Uh, one of his first papers, actually, I was, I was recently in Japan and I was told that this was something he worked on during his PhD. Uh, so Takasaki, he proved his representation theorem in the separable case. Bischteller uh, gave a proof that worked in the, in the non-separable case as well. But, but I can't resist, I can't refrain from interrupting. Um, the, what you're calling the Gelfand representation theorem is the first half of the Gelfand Neymarek paper. It's, uh, it's, uh, Gelfand did uh, Banach algebras, but Seastra algebras is, um, which it's is a, a, a big deal. Is, is a, and okay, anyway, uh, uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, talking about content, but. Um, yeah, no, thank you for that. It's good to know, <coughs> I'll, I'll update. So if you remember back in the commutative case, we had this equivalence of categories between compact convex sets and function systems. Well, we have the same thing in the non-commutative setting where now we consider NC convex sets and operator systems. And so this, this was observed first by Webster and Winkler in 1999, where, so they considered a framework, the framework of matrix convex sets. And so this is also true, of course, for NC convex sets, because the, if you're familiar with the theory of matrix convexity, the NC convex sets contain the information you would get by looking at the matrix state space of an operator system. But the NC convex set contains more information, which turns out to be important when you start to consider function theory on, on these convex sets. It's really essential, absolutely essential that you consider not just the finite dimensional sets, but actually the, the points that live in, at infinity. So. This will become a little bit more clear later, I think. But the point is that there is a, a, an equivalence of categories in this non-commutative setting. And so what, what I mean by non-commutative Choquet theory is exactly analogous to the description I gave in the commutative setting. It's the study of your, your compact NC convex sets, or equivalently the corresponding operator systems, using the duality between these two objects and the interplay between the operator system and the C star algebra that it, <clears throat> excuse me, that it generates. I should say that uh, my talk is, is mostly in, from an operator algebraic point of view, but these, these NC convex sets more and more frequently in the theory of uh, real algebraic geometry, non commutative real algebraic geometry, people are actually finding very nice examples coming from, uh, from geometric objects. And so it's, it's quite interesting, I think, that there's this sort of operator algebraic description of these geometric objects. <clears throat> okay, and I'll just advertise. Uh, so Ken and I, our paper came out last year, but there's an extensive theory of NC convex sets 
and functions on them. Um, we get non-commutative analogs of all the major theorems from convexity, like the krein milman theorem, its converse, the Jensen inequality, and so on. Okay. Uh, this does provide a new perspective on operator systems. And so just for one example, the, there's a very robust notion of extreme point for an NC convex set. And it turns out that this exactly corresponds via this dual equivalence to Arvison's notion of a boundary representation for an operator system. Uh, this tells you, if, if you're familiar with the uh, theory of boundary representations, it took quite a while to come up with a proof that they actually exist. So this tells you that unlike the commutative setting, the existence of extreme points in the non-commutative setting is actually quite a non-trivial thing. Even in the case of a C star algebra, it turns out that these, uh, the, the, the NC state space of a C star algebra turns out to be an interesting object. And that's kind of the theme of the rest of my talk. Okay. So now I'm gonna talk about a little bit of non-commutative Showcase theory, so I can define a notion of non-commutative showcase simplex. So just like in the commutative setting, there's a natural notion of a convex NC function on an NC convex set. So we can take as a definition, so, so of course the function's convex, if and only if its epigraph is, is a convex set, we basically take the same definition in the non-commutative setting. If you write down what that means, the epigraph of a of an NC function is a little bit more complicated, but there, there's a nice equivalent condition, which is simply requiring that the function satisfy what I like to think of as a, as a non-commutative Jensen type inequality. And it looks like what I've got on the screen. So F of alpha star X alpha, if you pull out the alphas to the outside of the function, uh, then you get, you get that inequality. So it's less than or equal to alpha star F of X alpha. Let me uh, just give you an example. So if I take a compact interval in R and I take from my compact convex set, I take the set of all matrices, self-adjoint matrices, with spectrum contained in that interval, it's not hard to check that this is a nice NC convex set. Uh, it's compact because each can is closed. And a self-adjoint function, uh, so I should say self-adjoint NC function in the sense that I've been discussing. Uh, it's convex in the sense above, if and only if when I restrict to the first level. So on the first level, I just have an ordinary function on this interval. If that restriction is operator convex in the classical sense, which means that it's convex when I plug in matrices instead of scalars, that's equivalent to being convex in our sense. So in this very special case of, of an NC convex set coming from an interval, and I should mention this is in fact the unique NC convex set with the property that the first level is equal to an interval. <clears throat> Excuse me. This uh, characterizes in this special case what the, con what the NC convex functions are. This fact is actually equivalent to what, what's now often known as the hansen pedersen Jensen inequality for matrix convex functions uh, or operator convex functions, which basically uh, is, is the last di displayed math that I have on this slide. Sorry, no, that's not true. Their inequality is really the, the Jensen type inequality that I mentioned above the example. So that being equivalent to the last displayed math in this slide, that's really the hansen pedersen Jensen inequality. <clears throat> So as in the commutative setting, I'll say that an NC state, and by that I just mean a map, a UCP map from C of K into MN, we'll say that it represents a point in K if when I restrict to the space of continuous affine functions, NC affine functions, that's the point evaluation at the point X. So in other words, it's ex exactly like plugging in, <clears throat> excuse me, X. And so as in the commutative case, Ken and I, proved a, a non-commutative analog of the choquet bishop duluth theorem, which says that for every point X and K, there's an NC state that represents X and in addition is maximal in the non-commutative counterpart of the, of the choquet order. And that's defined 
completely analogous to the commutative case, it's defined in terms of the convex NC functions. So mu is dominated by nu if whenever I plug in an NC convex function, continuous NC convex function, I get the appropriate inequality. And the reason that this condition, just like in the commutative case, the reason that this condition is important is it's an order theoretic, theoretic characterization of the support of our state being contained in the boundary, the extreme boundary, meaning the set of extreme points of our NC convex set. In the separable setting, once again, this turns out to be equivalent. Um, we do have an, an integral representation theorem in the non-commutative setting. We require separability because we're using here, so that the, the proof that we're using makes use of direct integral theory, direct integral decompositions of representations. And there, you know, it's plausible that there's a proof that doesn't go through that theory, which would be interesting because that would mean that this result would apply in the non-separable case. But what this says translated into our, into our setting is that if I have a point in my non-commutative convex set, then I can find what we call an NC probability measure, which decomposes that point in terms of the, the NC convex set K and specifically in terms of the extreme points because we can find a measure that's supported on the set of extreme points. Okay, so let me try to explain a little bit what I mean by this. And what I mean is that an, N, an NC measure, an NC probability measure, this is, this is now, uh, instead of taking scalar values, the values it takes are CP maps. And it's sort of, it's a way of, so you should think of uh, the case when, when a measure is finally supported, what it's saying is that I can evaluate my function f, or I can integrate my function f, uh, basically along my space k. I won't. I don't want to say too much about this at the moment. It's a little bit technical. But the the point is this integral representation theorem gives us an alternative representation, for example, of the representations of a C star algebra. So it gives us an alternative to the, the usual direct integral decomposition of a representation. Instead, we can really decompose a representation as an integral, as a bona fide integral. Okay. Okay. You now I have enough machinery now, I can, I can define the notion of a non-commutative showcase simplex. So just like in the commutative case, we'll say that a compact NC convex set is an NC showcase simplex or simplex. If there's a unique, maximal NC state representing each point in my set. And by maximality, what I mean is it's maximal in the NC show K order that I just defined. Okay. And remember that's equivalent to saying that it's supported, at least in the separable case, it's support lies in the set of extreme points of my NC convex set. So the intuition here is saying that K is an NC simplex if every point in K can be uniquely expressed as an NC convex combination of extreme points, just like in the commutative setting. Okay. So first of all, the first result I wanna highlight is that this actually is a generalization of the notion of a classical simplex. So specifically, if I have a classical simplex, there's a unique NC convex set with the property that it's first level K1 is actually equal to this to this set uh, C. Okay. And in addition, this unique NC convex set has the property that it's an NC simplex. This is a true generalization of a, of a classical simplex. But there are many examples of NC simplices that don't come from classical simplices. So here are some operator algebraic characterizations. So remember, if I have a an NC convex set, that's the same thing as saying that I have an operator system via the, dual, the duality of the two, or equivalence rather, of the category of NC convex sets and the category of operator systems. So we have the following equivalences. K is an NC simplex. That's equivalent to saying that the dual, the bidual of the corresponding operator system is a von Neumann algebra. And so this is a notion that was 
considered by Kirchberg and Wasserman in a paper, I think from 1997, they considered what they call C star systems. So an operator system is a C star system. If it's bidual, is a C star algebra, is, or, is completely order isomorphic to a C star algebra. But because it's a dual space, we know that it must then be completely order isomorphic to a von Neumann algebra. Okay. The third characterization is in terms of uh, tensor products of, of operator systems. And actually this shouldn't be a big surprise because there's a paper of Nemyok and Phelps, I think from 1969, where they characterize classical showcase emphases in terms of the nuclearity of the corresponding function systems. They don't use this terminology, but this is essentially what they were doing. And uh, I think, so, so Afros actually cites these results. They think Afros in their paper, I think Afros was a big influence in what they did, but I believe this was a big influence on uh, some of the work that Afros later did on the theory of, of injective operator systems. So it shouldn't be a big surprise that tensor products enter the picture here as a, as a characterization. So there's a notion of commuting tensor product in the category of operator systems. And <clears throat> it turns out that being, that this tensor product being equal to the maximal tensor product is equivalent to the underlying non-commutative state space being an, an NC simplex. And so this immediately gives us some examples that don't come from classical simplices. So specifically, I have, if I have an operator system with NC state space K, and if S is a C star algebra, so if, if S is a C star algebra, then of course it's bidual we know is a C star algebra, so condition two is satisfied. Uh, or if it has the weak expectation property. So in particular, if it's nuclear, it has the weak expectation property. We know that if, a, if a, an operator system is nuclear, then I believe this is a result of uh, uh, Choi and Afros, maybe, maybe Afros and Ruan. But uh, the dual of that operator system is, is, a, is a C star algebra or von Neumann algebra. This is equivalent to injectivity. Um, sorry, it's equivalent to nuclearity of the operator system, I should say. And in this case, K is an NC simplex. So this gives us examples because uh, it's a fact, not so hard to, to prove, but it's a fact that if I have a non-commutative C star algebra, then its state space is never a simplex. And it's never a classical simplex. So any non-commutative C star algebra immediately gives us an example of, a, of an NC simplex, which does not come from a classical simplex. Here's another very interesting class of examples. So in the classical setting, there's a unique metrizable simplex called the Poulsen simplex. And this is uniquely determined by the fact that its set of extreme points is actually dense, which is a very strange property to have. <clears throat> it's unique. Uh, this was proved by Linnen, Strauss, Olson, and Sturmfeld in a, in a 1978 paper. It, plays a very important role in dynamics and descriptive set theory. It, it comes up a lot. It's a Fréchet limit, if you're familiar with that terminology. So we'll say, in analogy with this, we'll say that an NC showcase simplex is an NC Poulsen simplex if its set of extreme points is dense. This is equivalent to the maximal C star algebra of the operator system being equal to the minimal C star algebra or C star envelope of the operator system. And a, a paper, actually the same paper of Kirchberg and Wasserman that I mentioned in my previous slide from 1998, they construct examples of operator systems with this property. Actually a whole host of examples of operator systems with this property. So what that's telling us is that in the non-commutative setting, unlike in the commutative setting, and by the way, these, these operator systems are all separable. So this tells us that in the separable setting, in the non-commutative setting, there are lots of non-isomorphic Poulsen simplices, which is quite different than the commutative setting. But what's interesting is that a result of Lupini from 2018 tells us that if, in addition, we require nuclearity, then there is a unique NC Poulsen simplex. 
So if we, if we scrap nuclearity, there are lots, but if we require nuclearity, there's only one. It's very, I think, very interesting. Okay, so now I wanna talk about non-commutative analogs of these applications I mentioned at the beginning of my talk. So I wanna give a characterization of the state space of a unitless C-star algebra without requiring commutativity. It turns out that the right object to work with rather than the state space is, this, is the NC state space. And there we get a nice characterization of NC state spaces which correspond to C-star algebras. So as in the commutative setting, let's say that a, an NC simplex is a Bauer simplex <clears throat> if its extreme boundary is closed. Then Ellie and I showed that a, a compact NC convex set is affinely homeomorphic to the NC state space of a C star algebra, a unital C star algebra, potentially non-commutative, if and only if it's an NC Bauer simplex. So this completely describes the NC state spaces of unital C star algebras. And uh, I'll just point out, notice that this, in general, you're not going to be able to see this if you're only looking at the matrix state space of your, of your C star algebra, because in general, your extreme points, they might lie. So, so the extreme points will correspond to irreducible representations of your C star algebra, and they might lie at, infinite, in, uh, at infinity. So they might not even exist in finite dimensions. Uh, there's a, there is a deep characterization due to Alfson and Schultz of compact convex sets, ordinary compact convex sets, which arise as state spaces of C-star algebras, but it's significantly different. It doesn't, uh, it's not similar at all to the, to the classical characterization in terms of Bauer synthesis. If you want that, then uh, as the theorem shows, you need to look at the NC state space. Okay, the second application is to a kind of non-commutative analog of the ergodic decomposition theorem. So now I have a C-star dynamical system where my C-star algebra is potentially non-commutative. I have an action via automorphisms of some group G. There's a natural way to get an, get an action on the NC state space. And this turns out to be the right analog of passing to the action on the space of probability measures. Uh, this was used quite fruitfully by Chris Schaffhauser and I in a paper from 2018, for example, which is actually uh, one of the things that motivated the work I'm talking about today. So the, in general, whenever I have an NC convex set, compact NC convex set, then the, yeah, so the, the course, and I have an action uh, by a group G on that space, then the set of invariant states will be an NC simplex, an NC showcase simplex, just like in the commutative case. And following that, we'll, we'll say that an invariant, so if K now is coming from a C star algebra, so that means it's, uh, it's an NC state on, its, on my C star algebra, we'll say that it's ergodic if it's an extreme point of the set of invariant NC states, which is itself an NC convex set. Then uh, just an application of our non-commutative Chouquet-Bishop-Duluth theorem tells us that every invariant NC state decomposes in terms of ergodic NC states and it's unique in an appropriate sense because uh, the fact that it's a simplex guarantees that there's a unique way of decomposing things in terms of extreme points. That's exactly, remember, what being an NC simplex guarantees. Okay. And finally, the third application which is a, a non-commutative extension of, of this dynamical characterization of property T due to Glasner and Weiss. So what Ellie and I show is that a group has property T if and only if whenever I have a, a C star dynamical system with NC state space say K, then the set of invariant NC states is an NC Bauer simplex, which is equivalent by the first application to saying that it's it's really the NC state space of some C star algebra, which again, in this setting, may bear very little resemblance to the C star algebra A. So I have a C star algebra A, I have an action of a property T group on A. That means somewhere there's a C star algebra B corresponding to the set of invariant NC states. And A and B may not be very closely related. This is, I think, quite interesting. And this, as I said, 
this property characterizes property T groups. And it turns out that in this special case, it's actually enough to just look at the first level. So in other words, just to look at the state space of my C-star dynamical system. And so we can get, get the following corollary, which is that a group has property T, if and only if, whenever I look at the state space, then the set of invariant states of, of my C-star dynamical system is actually the state space of some other C-star algebra. Again, these C-star algebras are not necessarily that closely related. Okay. Thank you.